Thank you for joining us today for Dr. Zachary Brown of the Indian Island Institute's lecture, tackling the climate crisis from knowledge to action. Um, we would like to begin by acknowledging with honor and respect the indigenous nations on whose traditional territories the university now stands and on whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. We also acknowledge the elders past and present, including MSU's current council of elders and humbly ask for their guidance. The Valley of the Flowers has been and remains a place for learning for Native American peoples who for millennia have passed ways of knowing, being, and doing from one generation to the next. While land acknowledgement is not enough, it is an important social justice and decolonial practice that promotes indigenous visibility and is a reminder that we are on settled indigenous land. And I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, um, Dr. Zachary Brown. Um, as a climate scientist, educator, and activist, Zach Brown has been deep in the climate trenches for over a decade. He's the director of the Indian Island Institute, a nonprofit education center that deepens students' connection with the natural world. He lives in Alaska and loves to hunt, fish, and garden with his wife, his wife Laura, and his dog, Aaliyah. Welcome, Zach. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, and we're so excited to hear what you have for us tonight. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Atticus, can you hear me okay? Yes. That doesn't sound good. Are you okay, Atticus, on the sound? I believe so, yes. Yeah, I can hear you, um, and I've muted everyone else. I think we're all good. Great. That echo might have just been somebody needing to mute. Anyway, um, well, I, uh, I hope you all are happy and healthy back at school with uh, all the Zach, Zach, we uh, lost your sound for a sec there. I'm not sure what happened. First of all, it's it's so unfair for us to even be here talking about this, for this work to be put on your generation's shoulders. Um, the last couple of generations, including mine, uh, have really failed you. You're just now coming of age and the world is on fire. You know, we face these interlocking crises and they're all on display every time you open the news or look out your window. Uh, but no other crisis comes even anywhere close to the magnitude of the climate crisis. And that's because climate intersects with all these other crises from coronavirus to armed conflict, uh, immigration and refugees, extreme inequality, uh, race, gender, air and water quality, public health. It takes all of these challenges and injustices and makes them worse. Uh, this is why the climate movement has stopped talking about protecting polar bears and reframed the issue as climate justice, because uh, this connects the dots between climate and all these other social justice issues we face. So what I hope to do today is to help you connect the dots and to help you think bigger about how much power you have to make change. So I'd much rather uh, be giving this presentation in person, of course, and to see your faces and to to shake hands and hear about your experience with climate change. Uh, I'm much more animated in person than sitting on my couch at home, but you'll just have to do with my voice. And, you know, there are certain advantages. Um, I'm sitting on my couch at home. Uh, I've got a beer poured, so it's not all bad. And um, I'm going to share my screen now and we're going to going to dig into this. So first I'll just, oh, uh, first I'll just do a little bit of background about myself. Let me share my screen here. Screen, bah, type screen, allow. Okay. All right. Atticus, are we okay? Can you see it? We are we okay. Are great. Okay. Great. Okay. True nature of the climate crisis. On we go. Uh, so um, 
my background is in climate science. I spent uh, years working on ice-breaking ships in the Arctic and Antarctic seas. Uh, I was super privileged to get to go to the ends of the Earth, pretty incredible places. Uh, here I am taking water samples from under the Arctic pack ice and uh, here in Antarctica, chilling with penguins between drilling ice cores. But after enough time passed and emissions just kept growing and the climate just kept warming, I started to feel like I wasn't doing enough, like my science was really not making much of a difference. And so I turned more towards climate education and activism. Um, when I finished my PhD studies, I did this big crazy trek up the coast. I set off walking from Stanford University in California. Uh, this is me just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And when I got to Washington State, I got in a kayak and I paddled up the inside passage. Uh, the whole thing took me about four months to go 2,300 miles. And my goal was to start a school up here in Alaska, a field school called Indian Islands Institute, where we teach about climate change. Uh, this is a student group on top of the island. That's how I connected with Atticus in the first place. Um, the expedition ships his dad works on come and visit Indian Islands Institute. Uh, who knows, maybe one of you will come do a course or an internship up here sometime. So in these various roles, uh, I've taken a pretty deep dive into the climate crisis. And the first thing that I can say about it is, thank you for being here, for taking time out to join me, to hear about it. We need all hands on deck right now. Uh, the hour is very late. As Greta Thunberg puts it, our house is on fire. So this is where we're going today. Why aren't we changing? Uh, we're going to go to a pretty deep and dark place today. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you because I believe that before we can make change, we have to understand the true nature of the crisis. Uh, and if you stick with me, out of that deep, dark place, we're going to emerge back up into the light like a, like a seed that got buried. So if you're ready, let's dig into it. Let's start with what climate change is not. The climate crisis is not a scientific problem. Uh, take it from me as a climate scientist, we're not stuck in inaction because we don't know enough. Uh, we know plenty. Uh, it's not a scientific problem in its basis, its physical basis. That won't be a surprise to any of you. Uh, the physics behind the greenhouse effect and climate change has been understood since the time of the US Civil War. That's when scientists first examined the absorption spectrum of CO2 and the other gases of the atmosphere and realized that CO2 absorbs radiation at the same wavelengths as the Earth emits it, thus trapping its heat. By the 1890s, uh, Svante Arrhenius, the Swedish chemist, had advanced a full-fledged theory of global warming. Uh, he predicted that the burning of coal would eventually warm the Earth. So the fact that CO2 is a triatomic molecule that absorbs infrared radiation that the Earth emits. It has nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with economics, nothing to do with religion or belief. It's just a fact. And we've known about it for 150 years. There's nothing new in this science. Climate change is also not a scientific problem in its solutions, which may come as a bit more of a surprise. What I'm showing here is from uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, showing the price of solar panels in orange and global solar installations in blue. So you can see the exponential decline in price and the exponential increase in solar capacity. I just wish I had an updated version because this only goes through 2015 and that's five years ago, which is a lifetime as fast as things are moving in the renewable energy world. So a couple years ago, Bill Gates, one of the world's richest men, decided he was gonna turn some of his philanthropy toward the climate crisis. And he came out and he said, we need an energy miracle to fix the climate crisis. And people from the climate movement who've actually been paying attention, who've actually been following what renewable energy engineers have done, slapped their foreheads and said, no, we don't need an energy miracle. That makes it sound like at the moment we have no choice but fossil fuels, which is complete BS. So. Michael Liebrich, the CEO of Bloomberg New Energy Finance and a global renewable energy expert, responded, 
Are you kidding? The price of solar power has come down 150 times in a quarter century, and deployment has gone up by 115,000 times. How much more miracle e do you need your miracles to be? You now, this is our miracle. It has arrived. Solar now delivers the cheapest energy ever anywhere from any technology in history. Uh, and I could show comparable miracle graphs for wind power, for battery storage, for electric vehicles, for smart grids. Uh, I have an entire talk entitled, Everything You Think You Knew About Renewable Energy is Outdated. Uh, I'm not going to be able to go into that today. Um, just suffice it to say that the renewable energy revolution is going so fast, it has demolished the predictions of the world's energy experts. And so, Mark Jacobson, who's uh, a colleague of mine from Stanford University, has for the last decade or so been publishing these comprehensive roadmaps for every nation on Earth and every state of the Union to convert entirely to wind, water, and solar with existing technology. So going 100% renewable with existing technology. And not only are these plans super workable, but they would create more jobs than they would lose, and they would save millions of human lives, primarily through the reduction of air pollution, which causes some 10,000 premature deaths every single day around the world. And the Green New Deal, if you followed that, has shown us how to make this a just transition, one that leaves nobody behind and cares for American workers and for frontline communities. So it's really hard to see what's not to like about this. We create jobs, we save millions of lives, and oh yeah, as an added bonus, uh, we avoid the catastrophic impacts of climate change from mass extinction to global famine. So the question is, why aren't we doing it? To understand that, we can turn to the work of Bill McKibben. McKibben is uh, one of the our great climate leaders. Uh, he's a professor at Middlebury College. And uh, in 2012, he published a sobering article in Rolling Stone, which I consider the most important climate change article ever written. Uh, this was the cover photo of that issue of Rolling Stone, Justin Bieber, hot, ready, legal. Uh, but if you look in the top right is an article called The Terrifying New Math of Climate Change. And in it, McKibben lays out three numbers that really clearly show the true nature of the climate crisis. So I hope you really focus in and come with me now, because this is just this is just the core of the crisis that we face. The first number, two degrees Celsius. This comes from the uh, Copenhagen climate talks in two thousand nine. This is the uh, the the ceiling for global temperature rise relative to pre-industrial temperatures. In, otherwise, in other words, this is how much we can warm the planet before ca catastrophe really hits, or in the dry language of the IPCC, before we reach dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. I'm meaning, you know, spiraling extreme weather disasters, famines and droughts, uh, a refugee crisis beyond imagining, the death of all coral reefs on the planet, the flooding of Earth's coastal cities, these are the things that happen when we hit that two degree C threshold. To put this in context, does anybody know how much we've warmed the planet so far? It's just about 1.1 degrees Celsius so far. But it's important to understand that even if we stopped emitting today, the planet would continue to warm to about one and a half degrees Celsius, about 1.5. There's a lot of lag time built into something as massive and as complex as the global climate system. So we've already locked in 1.5 degrees, and our limit is 2 degrees. Second number, 565 gigatons. This is the amount of additional carbon we can emit from here onward and still stay below the 2 degree threshold. That is, this is our carbon quota before disaster hits. Uh, very roughly, if we burn less than this, we're okay. If we burn more than this, we're screwed. Now, each year, humanity emits around 35 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. What the hell is a gigaton? Uh, it's a billion metric tons. Uh, if you've seen the film Free Solo, uh, where Alex Honnold scales uh, El Capitan, that wall is about a kilometer high. If you were to take that height and make it into a cube, a one-kilometer cube, 
and fill that with water, it would weigh a gigaton. Multiply that weight by 35 and you come up with how much carbon we emit each year. It is a shitload. So if you do the simple division, 565 divided by 35, you'll see we have about 16 years. So that by the time today's kindergartners are graduating from high school, we will have surpassed our quota of carbon we can safely emit. Except that this article was written eight years ago. The third number, 2,795 gigatons. This is the amount of carbon that would be released if we dug up and burned all the proven fossil fuel reserves, all the coal, oil, and gas that fossil fuel companies are sitting on, as well as countries that act like fossil fuel companies like Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, increasingly the US, which is now the world's largest fossil fuel producer. This carbon is technically still in the ground, but as McKibben points out, it is economically above ground. See, it's the basis of fossil fuel company share prices on the stock market. Uh, companies are borrowing against it, trading it, using it as collateral, dealing in oil futures. Entire nations are basing their budgets on it. The point being, this is the amount of carbon we're planning to burn. And it won't have escaped your notice that 2,795 is more than 565 five times greater. On the right is the amount that climate scientists say is safe to burn. On the left is the amount global society is planning to burn. So this is deeply problematic, deeply disturbing. This is what Greta Thunberg means when she says, I want you to panic. But take a look at the implication here. What this implies, what this inequality implies is that in order to have a hope of staying within the two degree C limit, we need to leave 80% of these proven fossil fuel reserves in the ground, right? Does that make sense? We know that five times more than can be safely burned is under our feet, so we can only burn one fifth of it. 80% has to stay in the ground. But here's the kicker. Here's where we come to the fourth number. That 80% of proven fossil fuel reserves, the unburnable carbon, that represents some 20 trillion dollars in profits to the fossil fuel industry. So now we can begin to see the true nature of the climate crisis. Try telling ExxonMobil or Royal Dutch Shell they have to leave 20 trillion dollars in the ground. You think they're going to like that very much? Hell no, they're not going to like that at all and they're going to fight hard to ensure the number we burn is the one on the left and not the one on the right. Begin to see where we're going to with this? So Let's dig into the true nature of the climate crisis. I know it won't surprise any of you here to learn that there are very close ties between the fossil fuel industry and our government. Um, here's our, my cute little graphic of the fossil fuel industry and our nation's capital. And there's an exchange going on here between the two. There's an arrow going in this direction. What does this arrow represent? What does industry do for government? Well, the big one is campaign finance. Uh, if you aren't aware of the 2010 Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, you just have to get educated about that. Um, it is the dominant factor shaping the grotesque inequality and inhumanity of our modern United States. Uh, Citizens United redefined corporations as people and redefines campaign contributions as free speech, thus allowing corporations to pour virtually unlimited and undisclosed amounts of money into elections. So there is a tidal wave of dirty money sloshing around our government ever since that. Uh, how about uh, lobbying? Uh, the fossil fuel industry is lobbying our federal government at a rate of about a million dollars per day. Uh, that amount has gone up significantly under the Trump administration. Basically, lobbying just means pushing for policies that benefit them. How about the arrow the other way? What does the government do for the fossil fuel industry? One of one of the biggest for sure is uh, subsidies and tax breaks. Uh, the fossil fuel industry globally is subsidized uh, to the tune of some $2 trillion per year, uh, depending on the study you read. Subsidies make fossil fuels artificially profitable for fossil fuel companies and artificially cheap for consumers so that we're happy to keep filling up our giant gas guzzlers. How about policy. Uh, policies like being able to drill on federal lands, a reduction of oversight and regulation. 
not having to disclose, for example, the slurry the fracking industry is pumping into our groundwater. Policies that make it harder for people to purchase electric vehicles or add rooftop solar, on and on and on. Uh, and increasingly right now, we're seeing political appointments. That is, people from the fossil fuel industry coming straight into government. Basically, the government is saying, we don't even need to make the policies for you. You can walk right in the door of the Capitol building and do it yourself. Uh, and around and around and around this circle we go. This is the nefarious circle that drives the climate crisis. And out of this relationship between industry and government is spawned climate change denial. Uh, it's extremely important for us as global citizens to understand that climate change denial doesn't just happen. Uh, half the country doesn't just wake up one day and say, you know what, that climate science is a load of hooey. No, climate change denial is manufactured by the industry that stands to gain from it. Uh, you know, let's just say it is extremely profitable for the fossil fuel industry to have the nation divided on whether the climate crisis even exists. Uh, so they work very hard and spend a lot of money to foster and foment climate denial. Um, over the last few years, we've seen more and more revelations about Exxon misleading the public and its investors. This is very well documented. So what I was, uh, what I was speaking about was, you know, um, how, how climate change denial is, is manufactured by the industry that stands to gain. Um, uh, this is, this is very well documented. I think this is where, where you lost me. Uh, in, in the 1980s, um, the Exxon executives got together, uh, with a bunch of data and projections from their very own scientists telling them that climate change is an existential threat to humanity and it's caused by the burning of fossil fuels. And these execs got together and they said, huh, this seems problematic for our business model because we sell fossil fuels. So here's what we're gonna do. Instead of actually facing up to this threat, we're going to spend millions on a smut campaign to confuse and mislead our investors and the general public. And if we spend millions doing that, then in the meantime, we'll be able to extract trillions. Sound good? All agreed? So just imagine those meetings really happened and they're still happening and the world is paying a devastating price for it. And I consider it to be the greatest crime against humanity in all history. Um, and in this climate denial work, they're no different than a dozen industries that have fought against science throughout the 20th century. Uh, big oil is using the exact same playbook as big tobacco. Uh, they intimidate and threaten climate scientists. Um, I have colleagues who've received death threats. Uh, they hire their own quote unquote scientists to go on TV and say CO2 is plant food or whatever their latest BS is. Uh, they fund a nationwide network of think tanks that publish books, films, advertisements, and websites, all saying that climate change is a hoax. Uh, they fund mainstream media to keep them from covering climate change, uh, infiltrate education, and of course, placing their favorite climate-denying politicians in office. That's the most important. And so you get headlines like this one uh, from The Economist that, you know, uh, the fossil fuel barons have poured more than $100 million into Republican presidential super PACs, raising concerns over special interests. That is the understatement of our century. Special interests run our government. Uh, and of these special interests, a couple deserve special mention. Uh, these are the Koch brothers of Koch Industries, who made their fortune on oil and gas. They spent almost a billion dollars toward the 2016 presidential election. Um, let's just say they got what they wanted. Uh, the corruption is so blatant, they don't even have to hide it anymore. Plain and simple, they are buying politicians to block any and all climate action so that their fossil fuel profit machine can keep churning. And this is the state of our democracy. Um, I remember going to see Al Gore speak at Stanford University. Uh, I was... Uh, I was fresh off a hernia surgery, so I limped in there, but I wasn't going to miss Al Gore. He was a powerful speaker, and he said, I'll never forget it, he said, we can't solve the climate crisis until we solve the democracy crisis, and we have one. 
We do not live in a democracy in this country. We live in an oligarchy where the wealthiest industries control our government. Uh, the climate crisis and the democracy crisis are one and the same. So let's get a little political and look at some of the actors in our democracy crisis, which drives the climate crisis. Scott Pruitt, uh, his campaigns for Oklahoma Attorney General were generously sponsored by the fossil fuel industry. Uh, he spent his time at the EPA dismembering the agency, especially anything to do with regulating fossil fuels or carbon emissions. But with all the chaos in this administration, he's out and he's been replaced by a former coal lobbyist, Andrew Wheeler. How about uh, Rex Tillerson? Our Secretary of State came straight from the CEO post of Exxon, where he mocked renewable energy to his shareholders, saying Exxon doesn't invest there because we choose not to lose money on purpose. Uh, whose interest do you think he was advancing in his post as America's most powerful dip diplomat? The voters? Uh, I have my doubts. Um, Tillerson is out too. Incredibly, our new Secretary of State is maybe the only person on earth even more corrupted by the fossil fuel industry than the CEO of ExxonMobil. Mike Pompeo is the largest recipient of Koch Brothers money of any federal politician. How about the biggest name of them all, the Vice President? Actually, you don't hear much about Mike Pence, and he likes it that way, but he has quietly become one of the most influential people in the administration, and he is one of the closest politicians alive to the Koch Brothers. Uh, as Jane Mayer lays out in the New Yorker article cited here, titled The Danger of President Pence, uh, he has carefully cultivated the Koch brothers' relationship by, among other things, helping boost their No Climate Tax Pledge, which has now been signed by over 150 members of Congress, um, basically pledging to, t to take no climate action ever. Um, Pence is the Koch brothers guy. Uh, he, not Trump, is mainly responsible for all the appointments of the fossil fuel stooges above. Not very Christian behavior from a man who's born again. And what I've listed is just a taste of how stacked our government is with fossil fuel goons. By the way, do you notice any other similarities between all these people other than their fossil fuel ties? They're all white men. The links between climate justice and social justice become manifest. Um, the, the point is there's no longer any clear line separating the fossil fuel industry from our government. And it's important not to see this as a temporary result of the current administration. The, the power of the fossil fuel industry and in government has been going on for decades. It's just the Trump administration has taken it to an almost unbelievable extreme. Um, and there's a word for this blurring of lines between industry and government, and that word is corruption. And what's the result of all this corruption? Well, government policy that favors fossil fuel interests, uh, rolling back auto emission standards. Uh, turns out, not surprisingly, this auto emissions rollback was not primarily pushed by the auto industry, but by the oil industry, because they don't like it when cars get better gas mileage, cuts into their oil profits. The clean power plan, rolling back the clean power plan, which would have uh, cleaned up our energy grid, undoing the methane emission rule for fossil fuel extraction. These are the three signature climate efforts of the Obama administration, auto emission standards, the clean power plan, and methane regulations. One, two, three, gone, just like that. Poof. But the Trump administration didn't stop there, not even close, uh, moving, uh, uh, open, opening nearly all offshore waters to drilling, opening the Alaska Wildlife Refuge to drilling, shrinking national monuments to boost drilling and mining. That's never been done in history. Uh, reopening federal coal mining and most notoriously withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accord, uh, which signed in December 2015 was a historic achievement, bringing together almost every nation on Earth with the goal of aggressively decarbonizing the global economy. At that time, there were two nations that didn't sign. Syria, which was in the midst of a brutal civil war, partly caused by climate change, by the way, so we'll give them a pass. Uh, those delegates had some other things on their mind. And the other nation that didn't sign was Nicaragua, who didn't sign as a form of protest because they said, the Paris Climate Accord doesn't go far enough. It's not aggressive enough in reducing emissions. Well, since that time, Syria and Nicaragua have both signed and the U.S. has pulled out, making the United States the only nation on Earth not committed to a global pact to reduce emissions. Are you following me on this stuff? Does this all make you as furious as it makes me? Uh, 
This is when I wish we were in person so that we could commiserate. When it comes to the corruption that drives the climate crisis, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, this is very well documented by some of our most respected investigative journalists. Uh, I'm bemused looking at this set of books and seeing that almost all the authors are women. Uh, it's a real contrast to the old white men we've just surveyed. I think it suggests a common sense change to our global leadership. Uh, so, but first a little more motivational material. The examples go on and on. Um, we'll co pull the plug on electric cars. Rooftop solar dims under pressure from utility lobbyists. At least this one has a good, uh, a, a good title. The Koch brothers are still trying to break wind. A Koch-fueled attack on electric buses picks up speed. We can't even get electric buses in this nation without the fossil fuel industry coming in and blocking it. Uh, and how, Koch, how the Koch brothers are killing public transit projects around the country. And it's not limited to the U.S. either. Uh, gas companies spend a, 104 million euros lobbying to ensure Europe remains locked into fossil fuels. Exxon misled the public. We know that. But Shell also knew. Shell also misled the public. How about this one? Pipeline to the classroom. How big oil promotes fossil fuels to America's children. So, oh yeah. And uh, of course, <clears throat> the corruption is vividly on display during coronavirus time. The Republican majority in the U.S. Senate and the presidency are pushing gigantic fossil fuel bailouts. They won't help nurses or teachers or postal workers, but they'll marshal billions to bail out the fossil fuel industry. Ramming through the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline, uh, perhaps the most hated and fiercely fought fossil fuel development project on Earth, because right now protesters can't gather to stop the bulldozers. It is sick. It's just sick. It's not just economic corruption or political corruption. It's moral and spiritual corruption. So I told you I wasn't going to sugarcoat it. This is why I'm sitting here and telling you that the fossil fuel industry is the enemy in the climate change fight. Uh, their business model is based on burning five times as much carbon as the atmosphere can safely absorb. And I hope I've convinced you in this last bundle of slides that they have no intention of changing that business model. Therefore, we can safely say there's no solution that does not involve taking them out of power. So one of the first questions that comes to our mind, though, when we see a statement like this is, well, wait a minute, we all use fossil fuels. Most of us have cars, we fly on planes, we eat food that was shipped up from warmer climates. Therefore, we're all complicit in climate change. Uh, you know, how can you rail against fossil fuels when you use fossil fuels? And this is a very natural response for us to have, and it's an extremely important point. So we're going to dig into this. Personal responsibility and personal action are very important. I, I think about carbon with every decision I make. Uh, but as my dear friend Hank reminds me, when Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, he was wearing a cotton shirt and that cotton was picked by slaves. You know, Point being, just because you are embedded within an unjust system, that doesn't mean you can't advocate for its change, uh, for, advocate for changing it. And in fact, I would argue we have a moral duty to advocate for its change. Uh, hypocrisy be damned. The easy way out of your responsibility is to smear somebody else as a hypocrite. The hard work is to go out and change the system. So don't ever let anybody tell you you can't push to end the fossil fuel reign of terror just because you're trapped, like all of us, in an unjust, fossil fuel-crazed society. Moreover, we have to keep personal action and personal responsibility in context. Remember that we all live within a system that the fossil fuel industry largely built, that they continue to make monstrous profit from, and that they're doing everything in their considerable economic and political power to maintain the status quo, to stop any change from happening. These corporations will not stop. Leaving $20 trillion in profits in the ground is impossible. It doesn't matter how much personal action we take. It doesn't matter how dire the warnings from scientists or the screams of protesters trying to protect their land. You know, they, the, the industry will sacrifice the habitability of the entire planet for everyone on earth and all future generations. They will watch the world burn before they give up their profits. That is the true nature of the climate crisis. And the proof of that is all around us right now. This, the scientific warnings are at fever pitch. The climate movement is stronger than it's ever been. 
and our nation is racked by one unnatural disaster after the other, costing us billions of dollars every year. But these corporations are moving in precisely the opposite direction, towards more dirty, unsafe, extreme fuels, extreme extraction. We're talking about deep ocean drilling, Arctic drilling, mountaintop removal, coal mining, hydraulic fracturing, aka fracking, and most infamously, the Alberta tar sands, which I'm showing here. Just look at this flayed landscape. So I'm, it bears repeating. In the climate change battle, fossil fuel corporations are the enemy. We need to turn the blame frame around. Self-blame is paralyzing. When we see ourselves as the ones to blame for causing global warming, what are we supposed to do about it? Uh, it causes us to live in despair. It causes us to shrink. Over the next few slides, I hope to dismantle the myth of individual responsibility for the climate crisis. Uh, there was a very important paper that came out in Science a few years ago by Elise Amel and her colleagues. Uh, they're environmental psychologists, which I think is really cool. Um, what they imagined was an individual person who's looking to do their part to help change the world. Uh, because it's more interesting and fun to be specific rather than general, I'm going to pick on Ari Romberg, who some of you are going to know from the, Ari's, from the uh, Honors College. And let's say Ari likes to reduce his carbon footprint by riding his bike wherever he goes. That's what he told me. So Emil and colleagues defined these various spheres of influence a person like Ari can have. The first is the private and personal. This is the classic reduce, reuse, recycle level of action. You know, for Ari, it means for, for, for Ari, it means uh, riding their bike around, riding to class, uh, and that's great. But maybe Ari wants to think a little bit bigger. He might look to the next circle and encourage his friends and neighbors to ride their bikes too. You know, he'll help his neighborhood uh, uh, build a bike shed. But that might not be enough. He might move to the next level and actually start a community organization dedicated to bicycles. Uh, they start a co-op to, to fix up and distribute old bikes and provide education and training and helmets. And if that wasn't enough, now Ari decides to run for state congress in Montana on the bicycle platform. And when he wins, he's going to introduce legislation that everyone in Montana has to ride bikes. Cars are outlawed. It becomes the law of the land. And eventually, after Ari does enough work and spreads the bicycle gospel, we reach the biggest sphere of influence, which is cultural. This is when we don't need a law on the books to force us to ride our bikes because, of course, we're going to ride bikes. That's our culture. Our founding myth is about bikes. If you don't ride a bike, you're not part of our tribe and you can leave. You know, we're bike people. That's when the cultural shift happens. But the most revealing thing about this diagram, this paper, is that they put an axis on it. Notice that the axis goes from the smallest to largest impact. And what it shows is that personal action is the smallest level of impact we can have. If we want to fix climate change, personal action cannot be all that we aspire to. This is a global systemic problem that requires global systemic solutions. Think about what we've seen so far. Do you think fossil fuel executives are operating on the private and personal level? Do you think they're getting into their boardrooms and saying, okay, boys, here's our strategy for growing the industry and making profits. We're going to use a little bit more fossil fuels as individuals. We're going to drive more and fly more and bicycle less. And that's going to increase demand for fossil fuels just a little bit. And that's going to make our companies more profitable. You think that's how they're operating? Hell no. I'll tell you the levels that the fossil fuel industry is operating on. They're operating where the real power is. They're operating on public level, influencing elections through donations, gaining political appointments, fueling voter suppression efforts, etc. And they're operating on the cultural level, funding a sustained campaign to create a culture that distrusts science and advertising to create a culture where to be a man, you have to drive a V8 F350 truck instead of ride a bike. So if we're stuck up here wailing about our personal carbon footprint and they're down there where the real power is, that nefarious circle will just keep on turning. This is why touting individual action to ourselves, to our friends and families is actually a huge disservice because it's a false tool. It is not effective. Uh, what I tell my students is, by all means, do these things that reduce your dependence on fossil fuels. Ride your bike, grow a garden, get to know your local farmer. 
but don't do these things because they'll fix the climate crisis. They won't. Do them because these are things that tend to make us happy and healthy. Ride your bike because you can hear the birds when you do. Uh, grow a garden because, uh, as my friend Hank says, worms are groovy creatures. Then go out and fix the climate crisis through collective action that's actually effective. You know, this is what the fossil fuel industry wants us to believe, that it's our fault and that the only way to solve things is to change ourselves. Because as long as we believe that, we'll stay here, up here on this ineffective level, trying to change as individuals without changing the system. And they can keep right on, drill, right on drilling. And I'm not just speculating that that's what the fossil fuel industry wants us to believe. They've spent millions to convince us to blame ourselves. This academic piece uh, details how uh, the whole concept of a carbon footprint is a fossil fuel industry invention. It was conjured up in B by BP in 2005 in a $100 million ad campaign. Here's what that ad campaign looked like. Look how they shift the blame. They're talking about your mark on the world. CO2 emitted due to your daily activities. And meanwhile, they're calling themselves beyond petroleum, even as they continue to lobby the government and fight tooth and nail against any policies to reduce the systemic addiction to fossil fuels. And look how they end. It's a start. They know it's only a start. They know that if we buy into this, it will make us totally ineffective at solving this crisis. This is where it is. I work in the environmental movement. I don't care if you recycle. Mary Higlar is one of our greatest environmental writers, a badass young woman of color. She's right. Check it out. This is the, uh, b the best proof to date that personal action simply doesn't work. Look at this headline. Because of the pandemic, greenhouse gas emissions could fall as much as 8%. That would be the biggest year-to-year -year drop ever. And the media went nuts about how historic this is. But that's not the real story. The real story is, why is the drop so small? Our world is totally transformed by the pandemic, isn't it? You know, around the world, we've been dropping our personal carbon footprints like crazy. We're not getting on planes. We're not getting in cars. We're not getting on cruise ships. And yet the projected drop is only 8%. The real story of coronavirus and climate change is the severe limitations to personal action. If our lives are completely transformed and global emissions only drop 8%, that's all the proof you need that we've been misled for decades about how to fix this thing. Uh, so this is, this is the takeaway from the master himself, Bill McKibben. This is the most common question he receives as one of our most dedicated climate activists on the planet. And he gives a simple answer. Become less of an individual. The beauty is there are real tools and they're readily available. This is the beauty of understanding the true nature of the climate crisis. <clears throat> you know, uh, once we understand the nefarious cycle between industry and government, we are empowered. We understand that the answers are much simpler than we've been led to believe. It comes down to one thing, taking the fossil fuel industry out of power. We've seen this graphic before. This is the nefarious circle at the heart of the climate crisis. So fixing it means joining the movement to break these arrows, to stop the corruption. The movement has many pieces, many ways to plug in. What does it look like for an individual to join a movement to take on an unjust system? I'm going to point you to just a few tools in the climate movement toolbox. And I know we're really getting on. Uh, we're not going to have much time for questions. Uh, not only is my presentation longer than I thought, but we had that uh, that five or ten minute interruption. But this is this is worth going through. So thank you for sticking with me. Divestment. This is possibly the best place for young people, especially students, to plug into the movement. Uh, the divestment movement is huge and growing. Divestment means that organizations are pulling their investments and endowments out of the fossil fuel industry and reinvesting them elsewhere. To date, thousands of organizations, religious organizations, cities and towns, nonprofits, and especially colleges and universities have pulled out of fossil fuels. Over $14 trillion worth of assets have been divested. This is not fringe. This is mainstream. And along the way, it has called huge attention to climate change and catalyzed a whole generation of young people to get involved in this movement. Divestment is being spearheaded by today's students. They're brave. The goal of the divestment movement is not so much to, to defund the fossil fuel industry, although $14 trillion is a lot of money. 
but it's more to take a moral stand against climate change. They say, these students talking to their administrators, it's morally wrong and hypocritical for colleges and universities to tout a message of preparing us to thrive in the future, while at the same time investing in an industry that is actively destroying that future. And that's a powerful argument. This chips away at the social license of the fossil fuel companies. More and more people understand the central message that they are the enemy. They are stopping us from taking action. I'm not too surprised to learn that MSU has not divested yet, but you all can join that effort. It's one of the best tools at your disposal. After what you've learned today about the fossil fuel industry, are you angry that MSU is still giving them money so that the industry can keep spreading denial and lobbying the government to stop climate action? Well, you can do something about it. How about finance? This is one of the biggest. This is the newest front in the climate wars. As McKibben puts it, money is the oxygen that fuels the climate crisis. Take away their financing and fossil fuel industry companies can't operate. The preeminent group which has risen to prominence within the last year is called Stop the Money Pipeline. They've particularly targeted Chase Bank, which has lent fossil fuels $196 billion since the Paris Climate Accord was signed in late 2015. Uh, I hardly need to state that this is inconsistent with the goals of the Paris Accord. Uh, Chase is financing climate destruction, and so are our other big banks. That has to stop. How else are people confronting the fossil fuel industry? Blockadia is a general term for people taking direct action to stop the reckless extraction. In some cases, it's motivated by climate change, but in most cases, it's motivated by people simply defending their homeland from being strip mined and poisoned by the fossil fuel industry. You won't hear much about this on the evening news, but protesters are blockading every single new piece of fossil fuel in infrastructure that is ever proposed, every pipeline, every power plant, every coal mine. Many of those battles they lose, the power of the industry is just too great to stop, but increasingly these protesters are winning David versus Goliath battles. As just one example of hundreds I could cite in the beautiful power of protests, you have the kayaktivists in the port of Seattle, blockading the polar pioneer from heading up to the Arctic. And ultimately, that was dropped after $5 billion in wasted investment uh, for a variety of reasons, including the negative press this reckless extraction brought to Shell. They dropped out of the Arctic. And I've done my time protesting against Shell's plans to drill in the Arctic, a place that I love. We scientists are some of the only people to ever go there. If we don't defend it, who will? But this year, this year, what's the biggest tool, the biggest thing we can be doing? Getting political. I'm not going to waste breath to convince you how crucial it is to defeat Donald Trump. But the U.S. Senate is every bit as important because even if we elect Joe Biden, who has the strongest climate platform of any presidential nominee in history, all our ambition will go nowhere as long as Mitch McConnell is Senate Majority Leader. Uh, he can block anything and everything, and he will. Uh, so this is the U.S. Senate map, and these are the big four toss-up states where Democrats could take control, paving the way for ambitious climate legislation the likes of which the world has never seen. And there are other targets beyond these four, Georgia, Iowa, Texas, Alaska, even Kansas, and Montana. The incumbent is Steve Daines, a paragon of the very corruption we've been speaking about. What I'm showing here is the top U.S. Senate recipients of oil and gas money, and there he is, number four on the list, taking over a third of a million dollars just this year. And what's the result of him being bought by the fossil fuel industry? He's a climate denier, of course. And I quote, I think there's still reasonable debate here. I think the jury's still out, in my opinion. I've seen some very good data that says there are other contributing factors. We're certainly looking at the effect the sun has, the solar cycles, versus CO2 and greenhouse gases. I'm not convinced. I'm a skeptic on both sides. So that statement is bullshit from start to finish. And I'm showing the League of Conservation Voters scorecard. This is not a perfect measure of his climate record, but it gives you a good idea. Lifetime score, 6%. He is killing the planet. No climate denier should ever be elected again. Steve Bullock obviously does not deny climate change and will act. And this race is close. So if you've been waiting, if you've been feeling uncertain about getting involved and getting active, wait no longer. 
Now is our moment. We have to donate. We have to campaign. We have to volunteer, make calls, knock doors. And even if you're too young to vote, that doesn't matter. If you get involved with this campaign, you could convince 100 other people to vote or more. Voting is personal action. Campaigning is collective action. Amplify your impact. Join the movement. Uh, it's not an overstatement to say that the fate of the biosphere and the human project depends on what happens this November the 3rd. If Bullock wins the Montana race, that almost certainly flips the U.S. Senate, paving the way for desperately needed climate action. And if you want to get involved but you don't know where to start, please contact me. I will point you in the right direction. It is time to get political. The good folks at MSU Honors College might be a little uncomfortable with me getting political like this, and it's not their fault. Uh, this this uh, does not reflect uh, the views of Atticus or MSU or anyone else. They don't condone this kind of political speech, and they don't endorse any political candidate, I'm sure. And I might not get invited back, and that's okay. Uh, but I won't sit here and watch one political party block climate action for three decades and pretend this is not a political problem. It is. That's exactly what it is. And I won't sit here and deprive you of the actual tools that can turn things around and preserve a habitable planet. I'm not going to sit here and ask you to change your light bulbs. The tools that work are all political tools because this is a political crisis. I'm speaking out and I hope you will too. Now, this is about the urgent, literally life or death need to elect leaders who are not corrupted and who will act. The election is 42 days away. Uh, if January comes and Trump is still in the White House and Republicans still hold a majority in the Senate and our world plunges into climate chaos, I want to be able to look in the mirror and say I did everything I could. And I want you to be able to say that too. It truly is now or never for the climate crisis. Um, so. It's 6.58. Um, I, have, uh, I have one or two more stories that I could tell um, that would last about another five to eight minutes. But I'm going to um, I'm going to pause right here. Um, uh, Atticus, what, what, what do you think? Wh where are we at? Um, should I go a little farther? Should we stop here and have time for a couple questions? Is it time for us to completely sign off? Um, I think we should be respect. We should, we should respect people who need to do um, homework and stuff like that. I think maybe we could take a couple questions. Um, although I'm seeing in the chat, people are saying keep going. So I don't know. Let's go for it. Yeah. Let's give it another well, five that, or ten minutes. That sounds good. Why? You know, uh, obviously, if you need to sign off um, in order to do homework or you have other commitments, then. Um, uh, I will see you uh, uh, again, I hope. Um, and if you want to stick with me, then um, I'm just going to go through uh, like uh, a couple of stories. And again, I think this will only be about uh, five minutes. Okay. And uh, what I'm going to do here, guys, is I'm just going to put the um, Text and Critics uh, attendance link in the chat right now. Um, did that actually go through as a link? I don't think it did. Um, can someone, okay. Um, Teddy, would you, could you figure that out real quick and just drop that in the chat? Um, that would be great. And, uh, so, uh, Teddy's going to get on that real quick. And, uh, so he's going to drop that in the chat. As soon as that goes in the chat, if you need to like get credit and get out of here and do homework, I totally get it. It's midterm season. Everyone's super busy. Um, you can go ahead and do that, but otherwise, yeah, let's let's have another another couple stories. <clears throat> okay, excellent. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, what I'm showing here, this is uh, Re Rebecca Solnit is one of my favorite uh, climate writers. She wrote what I consider to be the second most important climate essay of all time, in which she stated that the most important thing we can do to fight climate change is try. What does she mean by that? Well. History is rarely linear. You know, uh, perhaps the biggest lesson looking backward is that where we are now was completely unpredictable 100 years ago. And where we will be 100 years hence is also totally unpredictable. So we face some seriously dire projections. But 
if we just get out there and try, we have no idea what kind of nonlinear, unpredictable impacts that will have. Let me tell you what I mean. This is my favorite example. So you probably heard about the Dakota Access Pipeline protests back in 2016. Um, this was a pipeline crossing sacred Native American land. Uh, armed guards used attack dogs and water cannons in freezing weather uh, against peaceful protesters, which drew significant media attention. And so the Obama administration blocks the pipeline, a big win for the protesters and the indigenous people whose land and water it is. But it was a temporary victory because, as you can probably guess, Trump was elected. One of his first acts in office was to fast track the pipeline. The pipeline was completed in 2017, and it's now moving 500,000 barrels of Bakken shale crude per day. So you might conclude, well, the DAPL protests were a failure. The pipeline went through. What was the point? You know, what a waste of time. But you know who was there at those protests? A young woman by the name of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, the DAPL protests inspired her to run for U.S. Congress. So she mounted an improbable bid for New York's 10th congressional district, and she became the youngest woman ever elected to the U.S. House of Representatives at 29. And now she's completely changing the climate conversation. A young, magnetic woman of color is just shaking up our world. That's the power of protest. You know, it's nonlinear. Its outcomes are unpredictable, just like the future is. So we just have to get out there and try and join with other, others who are trying. And I'm telling you, there are millions of us. What about the example of Greta Thunberg? Now, from Sweden, she got fed up with adults in action, and she decided to do something about it herself. So she began skipping school every Friday to protest for climate action. At first, nobody noticed. And then a few people started to notice. And then in March of last year, over a million students worldwide walked out of their schools to protest. This is an image of the protest in San Francisco asking Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi from California to support the Green New Deal. That Zach, also... I think you're, sorry, Zach, I think your screen stopped sharing real quick. Um, oh. So if you could reshare it. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Gosh. That's okay. Challenges. Stop sharing. Choice. Might just have a little bit of a freeze going. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, it's kind of frozen on my end. Hang on a second. Dang. What do you see, Atticus? Uh, we're just back to the giant grid of everyone's empty screens. Huh. So, yeah. I don't know if you can like stop sharing, resharing, or you can. Yeah, just I'm, I'm trying to click. Way. I'm trying to click stop sharing, and it's uh, it's just it's just frozen. Um, gosh, I I hesitate to uh, I hesitate to close out of the whole thing again. Um, <laughs> no, I I really I really don't have uh, many more images. If you can hear me okay, then then we're I I, I think we're okay. Um, I'll just I'll just speak a few more words, and we'll call it good. Um. I was going to say, you know, uh, in March of last year, over a million students worldwide uh, walked out of their schools to protest. Um, so uh, I was showing an image of the protest in San Francisco, asking Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi from California to support the Green New Deal. That, that million student march all started with one 16-year-old girl standing up for her rights, uh, speaking truth to power. And then she was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. That is the power that you have, that every individual has. Uh, what will you do with it? So coming back to where we began um, with the true nature of the climate crisis, uh, just to sum things up, they'll tell you that climate change doesn't exist. Uh, they'll tell you we can't do anything about it. They'll tell you we're waiting on a technological miracle. They'll tell you that solving climate change would wreck the economy. They'll tell you we're too greedy and selfish to change our ways. None of this is true. The truth is that a very wealthy, very powerful minority is extremely threatened by action on climate change because it means leaving $20 trillion in the ground. Uh, they won't do it willingly. They'll fight us at every turn. 
It's up to us to take them out of power. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Zach. That was an amazing talk. Um, I think since the link's already in the chat, um, you guys are free to go if you want. Uh, we have a couple questions that I think would be worth going through, and I think everyone would love to hear your responses to. Uh, the Let's first one it. was from way back in the beginning. Uh, is from Ellen Brooks. Uh, here it is. As a senior in engineering looking towards technical science jobs, uh, what's the best way to find careers and look uh, and ways to help in the professional world? What's the best way to find beneficial work in the climate crisis? Huh. That is a great question. You know, I, I have in the engineering space myself, and so I don't have I don't have anything specific to offer about you know uh, there's great opportunities with uh, this or that firm or this or that sector. Um, I can tell you that you're in a space that is only going to grow, and that um, your your talents uh, will be put to very good use. I have no doubt about that, and it's um it's just. Uh, the renewable engineering is just one piece of this kind of vast climate puzzle of building a better world. Um, I'm sorry I don't have anything more specific to offer on that, but I'm uh, 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 if you if you write me if you write me an email, I can provide a fuller response. But um, uh, basically, I would just say you're you're in a great position at this moment to make a difference as a renewable engineer. Cool. Um, do you mind if I do you mind if we provide your email to students? No, please do. Please do. Okay. Okay. I'll stick that in the chat in a second here. Uh, but first, the next question um, from Emily Vanderberg is: uh, What's your opinion on adopting nuclear power for energy? Yeah, that is a good question. You know, um, yeah, n n nuclear power is is one of these things that uh, has environmentalists or people in the climate movement um, tying themselves up in knots. Um, so uh, I'll say I'll say two things on it. One, uh, if you remember back in um, uh, back towards the beginning when I was speaking about Mark Jacobson's climate plans, I mentioned that um, fossil fuels kill around 10,000 people per day. Uh, that's more way more way more than have ever been killed or even harmed by nuclear power. And we're talking about every single day. So the dangers of nuclear power are way overblown. I mean, we have 10,000 deaths a day from fossil fuels and uh, the, the dangers of them are, um, are downplayed uh, at every chance. So um, dangers vastly, vastly overblown for nuclear power. Um, but Two, I would also say that uh, nuclear power is often mischaracterized as carbon free. It's not carbon free power. Um, there is, uh, a, it's tremendously energy intensive to, um, to uh, extract, to refine uranium. And, uh, and then you do have this, uh, this challenge of, of nuclear waste, which never goes away. Um, that's why Mark Jacobson's plans move the world towards 100% wind, water, and solar. Uh, they do not require nuclear to make a carbon-free planet. And but um, I'm also not someone, and, and I believe in that. I'm, but I'm also not someone who's going to uh, sit here and say uh, our fight right now is not to shut down nuclear power. In my opinion, our fight is to shut down uh, fossil fuel power. Um, is nuclear power the best option? No. But do we need to spend our energy on it? No. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, um, next question is from Zoe Filbert. Uh, what's the best information to use to convince someone to be more invested in the climate change movement? Well, that is a question that every writer activist, educator struggles with, and I still struggle with it myself. You know, um, I, uh, 
I bring students out here to Indian Islands Institute and we get them out into the wilderness and help them appreciate the beauty of the world and then uh, hit them with some tough climate messages and hope that that inspires them uh, to act. But you never really know. I never really know uh, what they're going to do with that information or that experience. Um, I think uh, uh, I think that one of the things that's really clear is that people uh, are above anything. We are social creatures. Um, we react to and and make decisions uh, based on what our peers are doing. And so leading by example is fantastic. Um, showing that being involved in the climate movement when it's done right is actually beautiful and fun. You know, it's it's a drag when you're paying attention because you see that the world is dying, but you also, you know, going out and, and marching in the streets is so beautiful. You feel part of a movement, part of something much bigger than yourself. If you can demonstrate to the people around you how amazing that feeling is and that you're actually having fun doing it, they'll want to join you. And then the power of story, you know, uh, as social creatures, as, as, pe as, uh, humans with this great capacity for myth in our minds, you know, uh, stories are more powerful than than about anything else. So if you if you tell your story with the uh, with the climate crisis, um, then uh, I, I think you can connect to people that way. Awesome. Uh, our next question is from Cole Arthur. Will you comment on Michael Schellenberger's book, Apocalypse Never, and Judith Curry's claim that she was forced out of academia for disagreeing with the line on climate change? Huh. You know, I'm not actually, uh, I have not read that book, and I probably shouldn't, uh, I probably shouldn't comment on it without having more details. Um, if you, uh, if you send me, uh, an email about this topic, then I can, um, I can look into it. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think the gist is, is probably, so, it, um, I think the gist is probably the notion that, uh, someone was, forced out of academia because they did not um, buy into climate science. Um, and uh, I have not, um, I have not experienced that kind of thing in the academic world, which I was involved in, but uh, I'd, I'd be, I, I don't know about this particular case. I'd be interested to look into it. Thank you. Um, and another question from what Clark, how drastically would the current United States energy infrastructure and complex have to be restructured to to uh, stay in the safety zone? Oh, well, the uh, the 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 answer is drastic in the extreme. Uh, the The problem is, of course, that because of the actions of the fossil fuel industry, we have delayed so long that we no longer have time to have a gradual transition. It is, it is crisis mode. You know, uh, Bill McKibben wrote his first book, and indeed it was the first book, popular consumption book ever written about climate change. Uh, it was called The End of Nature. He wrote that in 1989. Uh, that's over 30 years ago. And he, he's, he, one of the things that he reflects on now as an older man is, just how easy and smooth the transition could have been if we had acted at that time. Instead, uh, we didn't act. And in fact, uh, carbon emissions have skyrocketed by like 50% since then. In fact, over half of the carbon that has ever been emitted by humanity has been emitted since 1985, since I was born. So we've done more damage to the climate knowingly than we ever did in ignorance. Um, and because of that, all that delay and all of that carbon that we've pumped into the atmosphere through, uh, through manufactured denial, through uh, uh, lobbying to stop government action and all the, all the uh, nefarious work that I've just detailed, um, we, are, we are at the very edge of the cliff. You remember how I said that um, 
uh, the the coronavirus pandemic caused a uh, was projected to cause something like an eight percent drop in emissions this year, uh, as compared to 2019. Well, think of all that upheaval. That's about the amount that we'd have to drop carbon emissions every year in order to stay within the two degree C window because we are so close uh, to the edge of our of our uh, of our carbon quota. Uh, we've burned so much. So. Um, the the uh, the revamping of infrastructure uh, is absolutely drastic. I recommend for you uh, a, a brand new book that's just come out uh, called "Winning the Green New Deal: Why We Must, How We Can." Uh, this is um, this is uh, edited by the leaders of the Sunrise Movement, and it it basically it basically shows um, just how drastic. Uh, the the changes would have to be in order to meet our uh, meet our timeline and meet our two degree C window, but it also shows how doable those are and how you get there. You know, it's uh, it's like it's like World War II when every factory and every home was contributing to the war effort and everything was shifted in that direction. That's the kind of scale of mobilization that we're talking about. Cool. Um, another question from Bailey Servalis. How would a potential conservative judge filling the Supreme Court vacancy impact environmental regulation in the future of climate action? Thank you for that question. Yeah, very timely. Um, the, a, um, a, a, a hardcore conservative uh, six to three majority on the court would be devastating uh, for, for climate action because, um, you know, I, I talked about how uh, electing Joe Biden is not enough. Uh, we have to flip the Senate too. Well, if you flip the Senate and you elect Joe Biden, now you have the opportunity to move forward meaningful climate legislation like we've never had in the history of this country uh, because of the power of the fossil fuel industry. We can have meaningful climate legislation on the scale and ambition that's needed, but you can bet your bottom dollar that uh, re Republicans in, and um, and conservative leaning groups will go to court over all of that, and a conservative majority will be able to strike down those climate legislation, calling it uh, unconstitutional, whether that's on uh, real or whether it's on dubious legal grounds. And so um, it's uh, it's very important to. Um, it's very important to not have a six to three conservative majority. Uh, does that mean, um, that if they do it, then, uh, Joe Biden and a democratic Senate should, uh, pack the court with more judges in my opinion? Absolutely. Because we're talking about the fate of the world, uh, breaking norms, uh, is something that uh, Republicans and the fossil fuel industry have been doing uh, for decades. That's why we are where where we are. Um, legally intervening in the courts in order to protect the fate of the biosphere and human civilization is something I would absolutely do. All right. Good. Last couple questions here. Um, one from Jessica Thompson. Uh, how much impact would switching to a plant-based diet have on the climate crisis? Yeah, you know, um, there. So, uh, you remember the um, you remember the spheres of influence uh, and the uh, the individual action um, uh, versus uh, the the various forms of of collective action that go out in these concentric circles. So, among individual actions, I think most analysts would say that the number one personal action that you can take is to switch to a plant-based diet. Um, industrial meats are just an absolute nightmare for the climate crisis, from the deforestation to the actual impacts of the animals themselves, uh, to all just all of the uh, all of the fossil fuel infrastructure around them, uh, growing the growing the plants that they use, the refrigeration in stores, everything. You know, they the uh, 
industrialized meat is an absolute nightmare for the climate. And so switching to a plant-based diet is one of, if not the most effective individual action that you can take. But don't forget, my whole message here is that individual action is not where it's at. It's movement building. You know, if you are part of a movement and you help grow that movement, for millions of people to switch to plant-based diets, and I believe that kind of movement is happening, then that's great. If you do it on your own, it it won't make a ounce of difference. Nothing. Zero. So joining the movement is where it's at. And plant-based diets are a part of that movement. And one from uh, William Johns. Uh, are you familiar with HR 763 as lobbied by Citizens Climate Lobby? And if so, do you feel like it goes far enough or will it be effective? Zach, can you, uh, can you hear us? Zach, can you hear us? Now I can hear you, yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, you clipped out there for a second. Did you hear the question? No, I missed it. Okay, sorry. I'll repeat it. Um, so the question was, uh, are you familiar with HR 763 as lobbied for by the Citizens Climate Lobby? And if so, do you feel like it goes far enough and will it be effective? Uh, right. I'm, uh, I am familiar with it um not not to the level that i can speak about it in detail you know this is um this is a price on carbon um and uh does it does it go far enough well it um a a price on carbon is not it is is a um one very small part of the solution for for years uh, a price on carbon was kind of seen as the holy grail, um, but the climate movement has really uh, moved past that, understanding that um, really taking on the power of the fossil fuel industry is much more important. And there are uh, most of the major players in the fossil fuel industry are advocating for a small, basically meaningless price on carbon. The, uh, the citizens climate lobby proposal goes farther than that. Um, so does it go far enough as a price on carbon? Maybe, but keeping in mind that the price on carbon is just one small piece of the completely society shifting effort that is needed. Cool. And uh, I think our last question here um, is from Ethan Kelly. Uh, I've heard that methane gases are much more potent than carbon dioxide in their contributions towards the change in global temperature due to the amount of livestock present in the globe. Obviously, there's work to be done in reducing, reducing emissions of both gases, but how impactful are methane emissions on the climate crisis? Yeah, methane emissions are hugely impactful. And, um, you know, yeah, in the... Uh, in the in the short term, they have something like uh, eighty times the global warming potential uh, as carbon dioxide, um, and so of course there's there's less methane being emitted than CO two, but um, methane emissions are are really a big a big part of the challenge when we talk about carbon pollution. We you definitely you definitely don't get a full sense of the picture unless you include CO two and methane. Um, the others like, uh, nitrous oxide and CFCs are, are pretty, pretty, uh, small by comparison to CO2 and methane. So, uh, what are the biggest sources of methane? Well, you, you named one, uh, which is livestock, um, landfills are a big source. Rice paddies are a big source, but the biggest source now, uh, it's becoming clear is the hydraulic fracturing industry, the natural gas industry, which uh, natural gas is mainly composed of methane, and uh, and methane is the least we now know. Uh, there's been a number of analyses in recent years. Uh, methane is released at every step of that process, from the actual 
uh, drilling, the extraction, the shipping, the refining, the um, the 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 chilling and liquefaction. And uh, so there was a uh, a few years ago, or let's say uh, going back as much as a decade ago, uh, methane emissions seemed to have stabilized and then they began to rise very quickly. And it was really unclear where all this methane was coming from. Well, we now know it was coming from the extraction of natural gas. And so this is just one of the reasons why the industry line about natural gas being a bridge fuel, uh, because it's cleaner and uh, is just complete horseshit. Uh, one, uh, its global warming potential is, uh, we now know, every bit as bad as coal because of the methane that it releases. And two, the, the natural gas industry is just as reckless as the oil or coal industry. They don't, they don't care about moving us. In fact, they definitely do not want us moving beyond natural gas as a bridge to the future. Um, they're just trying to make money like everybody else. So um, don't buy uh, anything they say or anyone else says about um, uh natural gas being a, uh, a a bridge to the future. Anyone who tells you that the answer to the climate crisis is to burn a new kind of fossil fuel, you, you can, you can laugh in their face. So, um, so methane, uh, methane is very important. And, uh, and the biggest source, uh, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna stop emitting methane when we stop uh, extracting fossil fuels from the ground. Great. Uh, all right, we have one last question that popped up in the chat, and then we should probably let everyone go. Um, have the benefits of the from the global pandemic uh, to emissions been canceled out by the increase in illegal logging and other activity like that throughout the world? Boy, I don't have any information on that. It's an intriguing question, and uh, yeah, I would, I, I, I believe that the that those those sort of uh a lot of those black market things are going on as um uh, as kind of normal society is upended uh but i really don't have any information uh on that i like the question awesome well thank you zach so much um this has been a real treat for all of us um i think we're gonna let everybody go at this point um, I just wanted to also share with you guys, uh, I think um, at MSU, if you're interested in more resources on this type of thing, um, talk to the Honors College. They have they know everybody on campus in terms of like what they're doing in terms of research or service or other opportunities you could get engaged in. Um, talk to Dr. Schultz, talk to Dean Lee. Um, other professors like um, you could talk to would be people like uh, Dr. LaChapelle. And two days away. Uh what would you do if the fate of the world rested on the outcome of an election 42 days away? What would you do? What, what would you be willing to sacrifice? How much time and energy would you be willing to commit? Now, that's my question for you. That's my challenge for you. And if you don't know how to do it, uh, it over those next 42 days, then, uh, then, then ask me about it. Awesome. Thank you.